Uh, hello to everybody joining us uh, tonight for this evening's talk with uh, Professor Susanna Passonen, uh, which is the second of the series public talks we are organizing as part of the uh, School on Gender, Sexuality, Culture and Politics. Uh, organized by the Coalition Margins in partnership with the LGBTI Support Center from uh, Skopje. Uh, the third one will be in December. Um, joining us, Professor N. Svetkovic, and it will be the last public uh, lecture. Uh, we are more than honored um, having Susanna today with us. Um, Susanna is a professor of media studies at the University of Turku, Finland. Um, her interest is in the field of uh, sexuality, network media, affect, affect theory, and she's part of an academic Finland, of the Academy of Finland uh, research project, uh, sexuality and plain media culture and the strategic research council consortium, intimacy in data-driven culture. She is most recently uh, the author amongst many books published and uh, it, it just uh, can't stop amazing me uh, how how uh, productive writer and, and how incredible writer uh, Professor Passonen is. But amongst her most recent books, uh, forthcoming is um, uh, Dependent Distracted Board, Effective Formations in Network Media, um, uh, forthcoming uh, with MIT Press in 2021. Uh, just went out of press, um, uh, Who's Laughing Now? Feminist Tactics in Social Media, co-authored with Yeni Sanden, um, also MIT Press. Uh, objectification on the difference between sex and sexism, uh, Rutledge 2020, with uh, Fiona Atwood, Alan McKee, John Mercer and Clarissa Smith. Then uh, Sex, Humor and Risk in Social Media from 2019. And the book that is uh, probably most... Um, tightly related to our today's talk is Many Splendor Things, Thinking Sex and Play, uh, published by Goldsmiths Press 2018. But of course, um, some of the um, other works include uh, probably personally for me, the first and most influential, uh, influential book was uh, Carnal uh, Resonances, uh, also co-edited many co-edited volumes, including Networked Affect, for example. Um, and, and many others. In today's talk, uh, Thinking Sex and Play, which is um, reminiscent on the one side on um, Gail Rubin's now classic uh, text on thinking sex, um, Professor Passonen starts with um, one a quote from uh, Lauren Berlan and one of her blog um, entries and texts, uh, which goes, uh, who knows what sex could be if people were encouraged to enjoy it as play rather than as drama. Uh, taking on this question, in this talk, Professor Passonen will examine sexuality through the notion of play and will argue for the importance of foregrounding the complexities of pleasure in critical inquiry. Uh, play in the realm of sexuality involves experimentations with what bodies can feel, what bodies can do. Uh, it can be and it is autotelic uh, and not necessarily involve, involving any dramas and narratives of or pursuits of purposes which are beyond pleasure and then that go in uh, resolving in the direction of resolving uh, personal developmental dramas or uh, sanctifying um, and providing cautions for the um, commodified myth of uh, romance, for example. The pleasures that sex yields can be strained, dark and hurtful as we become and we become undone will argue Passonen in encounters with other bodies moving in and out of zones of comfort. As the exploration of different possibilities, appetites and connections, sex allows for pushing previously imagined horizons of embodied potentiality in terms of sexual routines and identifications and um, makes us, transforms us in direction that go beyond, beyond identity and the biopolitical organization of sexuality through various um, uh, categories of sexual identities and gender identities, of course. Play sets things in motion and animates bodies, offering productive avenues for theorizing the contingency and urgency of sexual pleasure, drive, desires, orientations, and their congealment in categories of um, identity. Uh, I'm sure that uh, this talk uh, will raise a, a lot of interesting things uh, for discussion. I have uh, for sure already 
thought of many questions I would like to discuss with uh, Susanna, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I would invite all of you following us today live to uh, write your questions in the comment section on the live stream. So I'll be uh, reading those questions that we received to Professor Passonan after, after her uh, talk. Um, Susanna, I would now like to uh, invite you and yes, the floor, the floor is yours. I will, I will disappear from here. Thank you, Slavcha, for the most generous uh, introduction ever. Now, if there's strange sounds of, of um, grunting, it's, it's a dog, it's not me, um, but I'm trying to minimize that with my, with my headphones. So I'll share my screen because I have prepared slides. Um, so I'll be talking, as Slavcha mentioned, around a book project that I, well, finished a couple of years ago. Um, and basically, it's something that it became a pet, pet project very, very quickly. It wasn't something I was actually planning to do. Um, but I was in, in the autumn of 2015. Uh, I was working on the films of, of Jan Soldat. Um, and I started thinking about the notion of play. And since my book has a very beautiful cover, um, I absolutely do want to show it to you. So it's uh, the design is by uh, Rebecca Glyn Blanco, um, and I think it's uh, it's exactly what I wanted from a book cover because I wanted a book cover that sort of uh, is non-representational but sort of uh, conveys a sense of bodily liveliness. So the way that this project came about, and I'll talk about more the theoretical starting points, but this is the context. I was working on a, on a book chapter for an edited collection on the, on the films of Jan Soldat. Uh, Jan is, um, a, at least for a long time, was Berlin-based, I think he's now in Vienna, filmmaker who's been documenting um, sexual communities around the larger uh, Berlin region in, in Germany, mainly, although not exclusively. Um, and I was, uh, and his work, work basically sexual cultures, but a lot of that is sort of BDSM kink cultures. Uh, different forms of sexual play with a large focus on, on gay male cultures uh, for multiple reasons. I'm not really going to his, his uh, movie work now. Uh, but for example, Coming of Age, which is a 2016 film um, on age play, uh, was very influential. So there's a scene uh, where one of the men uh, is sitting um, in a kind of a crib uh, dressed in as a baby smoking uh, a cigarette and talking about how this experimentation first came about and he says something like you know you know I was sort of like we experimented and the first time it was like oh, it wasn't so great but then you sort of learn and you do it again and something happens and then it becomes something else and I was really interested in in the way that people in his movies talked about play for example in this instance as adult baby play not as something you are sort of born to do or something that's innate it's something uh you sort of learn to do through experimentation trying what works what doesn't work uh, and initially finding something that works for you and maybe for your partners as well hopefully um so Jan's work has been around this is um another adult baby film uh he's documented a private uh prison uh close to close to Berlin uh, with both kind of military play and then prison play. And this is um, from the uh, unfinished film, which is where I started my, my work on his films really, um, which is basically a, a, a document of a gay male slave um, who sort of talks about childhood trauma, his background, um, but then also with a very serious expression in one of the scenes says, that's the that sort of problem in these days. People don't know how to play anymore. So for him, play is very much kind of a matter of identity, but at the same time, um, it is, it's serious play, uh, but it is still a form of play. And I was interested in this articulation of, of play something as something that is that is very much serious. It's a matter of identity, uh, but it's also something a bit more complex. And I had this sort of like moment uh, where I think like there must be all these bodies of work around sexuality and play uh, in feminist and queer studies of sexuality that I've just haven't tapped into or can't recall at the moment. Uh, it turns out there really wasn't. 
And then I turned towards my game studies colleagues to ask about, you know, work that deals with sexuality and play. And it turns out there isn't a huge amount of work because in fact, in classic works on uh, theorizations of, of play in particular, sex is that which sort of defines the limits of what play is as that which is not play. Uh, in the works of uh, Calois or in uh, in Heising, are very different scholars. They basically talk about sex and play when it's about sort of out there forms of sexuality um, that are experimental, but not something that is routine, like extraordinary moments of, of sexual experimentation can sort of qualify as play. But basically with play, most scholars of play and games uh, they mean autotelic practices of pleasure, meaning uh, practices that serve no other end uh, than the pleasure of the activity in itself. And for me, I mean, this seems fair enough, something to be rather close um, to uh, my understanding of what sex might be. Um, but it turns out um, that the issue again was a bit more complex than I thought at first. So. I was, I was looking for bodies of literature that was, would sort of speak um, of the overlap. And I came um, across this thing from Mikhail Sicard. And again, I've misspelled his name with a Q here. It's just like, I can't get over it. It's Mikhail, it's not, it's not with a Q. I'm, I'm sorry, Mikhail, uh, I can't. I seem to do it every time. But basically in Play Matters, he talks about distinction of play or against the kind of conflation with play as simply being fun. This doesn't mean that play can't be fun, but they shouldn't be treated as synonymous. But rather, if we talk about play in terms of pleasure, um, then we need to understand that it comes with this effective range that can be very conflicted. It can be sort of dark. Um, it can be challenging. It can hurt. It can offend. Um, and I really like the sentence of, of Net not less than not talk about the fun part, but as pleasure. Um, and I like the opening us to the immense variations of pleasure uh, in this world. Now this said, moving forward in the book, Sicard also frames out sex from his notion of play following this kind of longer uh, tradition. But I was very much sort of inspired by his take and what play might do. So my, my, my project on sex and play hasn't really, it's not like an ontological project in the sense that I would be um, trying to answer questions of what sex is or, or, or that my argument would be that sex is play. I mean, that would be kind of silly. Um, I'm interested in thinking about what conceptualizations and theorizations of play allow in studies of sexuality. If we frame sexuality uh, and sex in particular through the notion of play and playfulness, then what can we, what kind of questions can we ask? Uh, how might this move certain discussion forwards? What might we find out? Um, so it's it's not a project of arguing against. Um, I've tried to incorporate all kinds of bodies of literature that deal with sex and play, from sexual play among squirrel monkeys um, to all kinds of bodies of literature, not with the idea that I'll critique what's been done, but rather I'm trying to sort of bring things together and add um, add to that discussion or make a different discussion happen. Maybe that's more apt. Um, so following Sicard, play can be understood and sex as a kind of an effective pedagogy, maybe, that can be strained and dark uh, in the pleasures that it offers. But at the same time, um, given the kind of centrality of, of sexuality in the lives of many, uh, not just as a source of, of pleasure, but as also as a political issue, as a question of identification, um, as, a, as a thing that goes well beyond with what bodies do in a certain time and place, alone or together. Um, there's kind of a magneticism uh, to the whole topic of, of, of sex in individual lives, in cultural representations, uh, in social arrangements um, alike. So I think approaching this through the notion of play, uh, although it might not seem obvious, I think it makes possible to uh, explore how and why sex matters uh, on the plane of, of affects. And here I take particular cue from uh, Sylvanus Tompkins, maybe not the trendiest of affect theorists always, um, but he writes um, about the about excitement um, as this kind of as a as an affect that adds magic to whatever we do. Uh, and there's a sentence: "I am above all what excites me." And this 
sentence that I came across years ago has really remained with me um, because it's really about the kind of um, effective investment um, and effective intensity that sort of comes about in our countries with the word that can be surprising, but it is that which constantly makes us. And when we are being made, we are also being unmade because we always transform. And I think that's, cru that's crucial when thinking about sex in terms of play. Now, as I mentioned in, in theorizations of, of, of play, uh, basically the starting point is that play is understood as this kind of pleasurable activity uh, that is practiced for its own sake. If we understand sex in terms of play, um, then it sort of involves the exploration of different bodily capacities, different appetites, orientations, and connections. Um, so that's my dog again. So my starting point is that both sex and pleasure are autotelic uh, practices pursued for their own sake. There is no other purpose. And this might be, seem obvious, but when I was doing readings for this book, I came across an Oxford University Press blurb for a early 2010s uh, sexological um, treatise uh, that, according to the publisher, offers a new controversial theory that sex is not just about reproduction, but also about pleasure. And that this would be presented, no, it's early 2000s, but the, uh, so that this would be presented as a controversial new theory. So theory not, it's just been tested. It's not, you know, proven. I was kind of amazed um, with the, uh, with that there could be still this kind of understanding that sexuality uh, is above all an issue of reproduction. I mean, I'm 45 and I have not once in my life had reproductive sex or sex with the aim of reproduction. I have said, have, you know, I've had sex in my life at some point. Um, but it, it's, it, it's a, such a strange kind of uh, understanding. So even in, in sort of studies of sexuality, pleasure seems to be like a difficult issue. Although for the layman or lay person, whatever, uh, that would seem like an obvious thing. It's a bit similar than in studies of porn, uh, reading a lot of work on porn that deals with politics of representation it would be very hard to figure out that people actually often might masturbate to porn and that might be one of the functions of pornography but i'm not talking about porn today um so if uh sex is that which becomes framed out of uh studies of games and play yes that a kind of boundary that's as that which marks the boundary of the field uh if you like um then pleasure sort of is in and out from studies of sexuality. And this I think is a very bizarre thing and something we might also discuss why that is. And it certainly doesn't apply to all work done on sexuality. I'm not saying that, but it's definitely a tendency. Um, but also while the terms play and playfulness have emerged with some regularity in feminist and queer theorizations of, of sex and studies of sexuality, there really hasn't been much theorization, um, let's say extensive mapping um, of the kind of effective capacities, shift, shifting horizons uh, of possibility that sexual acts, desires, and pleasures involve. So that's sort of what I tried to do in that book. Of course, parallel to all this, there is a whole kind of popular field of understanding sex in terms of play. So we have sex toys, we have Playboy, we have Playgirl, this kind of, uh, re kind of uh, recreational, um, fun part of sex that's been very much commodified in terms of play. And sex therapists, um, for example, uh, regularly recommend different forms of sort of sexual play um, as, as, a, as a way to rework on relationships. And there's a whole, I mean, of course, we can't avoid Fifty Shades of Grey, the whole kind of popular culture on certain scripted forms of um, certain scriptive forms, certain representations of kink practices. I'm not really gonna, we can talk about Fifty Shades lots more if somebody wants to. I've actually read all the books twice, twice. I take scholarships very seriously. Um, but in these kind of frameworks, uh, we get sort of games and play as this kind of ready scripted things that map onto a commodity culture. Um, and this is a very broadly developed field and with Fifty Shades, it's sort of, I would say, re-energized, uh, both in terms of fiction, both in terms of, of um, commodities. And apparently with the COVID pandemic, because people are locked in, uh, the market for sex toys and all kinds of uh, commodities has really expanded. 
Um, so this is one, one kind of framework in which sex is understood in terms of, of, of pleasurable play, for sure. It just doesn't always interface uh, with, uh, with scholarship. And this, let's say, with something like Playboy, there are obviously kind of uh, norms and limits to how that play is understood and how its value is, uh, is understood. So this kind of kinky tips for real couples sort of uh, examples that I'm offering here, it's basically a part of a market where sex therapists, advice columnists, self-help authors offer different scripts and variations of play to sort of spice up long-term relationships. And that's the idea that once the magic has sort of died, you can sort of spice it up a little. Um, but the premise here is that people are not prone to act, that they don't know how to play. So you have to sort of tell them how to play. Um, so it's a, it's a particular understanding of, of play as a kind of a, almost a game, almost, not quite. But also it's an understanding of sexual play as instrumental, uh, as a tool to rework on relationships. So in a way it's not understood as autotelic and in itself it's understood to serve a higher purpose such as marital happiness or something such, something of that kind. And they are all kinds of normative scripts. I mean, you don't have to dig very deep into a uh, doctor and nurse and stuff like that to understand that certain things do uh, repeat. And there's also a premise that sort of adults don't know how to play, um, but kids play. And kids don't, aren't, kids have nothing to do with sex adults have to do with sex. So there's an understanding that once kids sort of reach this kind of their teenage years and stop being kids and become sexual, they have become sexualized somehow out of the blue, they stop playing. Um, and of course, that's not quite the case. So one of the kind of discussions I'm going into in the book is, is, is reconsidering such binary divides by looking at adolescents who uh, participate on, in online, what they call uh, pervy online role-playing games by themselves. And these are like from 12 to 15 or something of that kind. Um, it was, um, there was a beautiful MA thesis by Celia Nielsen, uh, uh, who was an MA student of mine in Turku. And then we later with Sanas Pisak and, and, and Celia, we did an article on that. But on the other hand, you also get adults who play, for example, adult babies. So you get this kind of uh, different forms of play happening. And of course, with kids, kids do sexual play among one another as well. So trying to rethink this idea that sexuality is something that appears as if from nowhere in teenage years, it's rather something that changes throughout a person's lifespan. Um, and the way that we participate in scenarios of play also changes uh, throughout a person's lifespan. Life um, one of the things I was quickly noticing is that uh, studies of sexual play um, tend to focus on BDSM and kink. Well, that's like one open framing where the vocabulary of play is, is really offered. But in studies of that, there's a tradition to really look at trauma. Uh, so to think of kink and BDSM in particular in the sense of trauma as this kind of reworking of something. Um, so issues of normativity, power, risk, and trauma tend to cut through large bodies of literature. And this is a broader tendency in studies of sexuality that is interested in the kind of politics of sexuality um, that then sort of, again, makes pleasure kind of an evasive thing uh, when we're focusing on social operations of power um, or highlighting that as a frame for understanding what people do, then there's a danger that again, pleasure uh, sort of is something either taken for granted or something that is considered superfluous or, or not of elementary in importance. Um, but there really isn't much written on pleasure and play uh, beyond studies of sexual subcultures actually. Um, meanwhile, of course, play is the chosen term in scenes of all kinds. And, and as Kane Reyes, for example, points out, the invitation to play equals the invitation for sex without any need for relationships uh, as a kind of a framework to uh, legitimize or, or motivate play. So play happens in many shapes and forms in sexual lives um, and in sexual subcultures where um, where uh, the equation of sex and play most easily happens. 
And as Slavcha mentioned in the beginning, my, my other inspiration came from Lauren Bellan's uh, question, what would sort of follow if we started approaching uh, sexual, or thinking about sex less as a drama, which links to this question of, of, uh, of social power, um, and also think about it as play, what might it open up? And I'm not saying that social operations of power don't matter in the realm of sexuality, that would be stupid. Um, my interest is, is sort of like what we foreground and what we sort of focus on. And if we focus on pleasure, then we have to ask slightly different kinds of questions. And I think in my view, if we conceptualize sex in terms of play, uh, then it's something that allows for bodies to become sort of reattuned uh, in terms of their capacities, both in terms of reattuning towards one another, uh, to the events that bring bodies together, uh, although people can also obviously play alone. Um, and through play, bodies also can move beyond the limits um, through, within which their sort of desires or orientations and tastes have been previously confined. So it's kind of this experimentation with what bodies can do or what particular bodies like to do and what they don't like to do. Um, and I'm going to show you this balance quote because it's a nice quote. So play can be understood as this kind of testing out experimentation of um, different boundaries. For example, I mean, there's obviously the question of consent, what we consent to and what the kind of overall framework is, what our zones of comfort are and how we might slip um, from those zones of comfort through notions of play. I mean, stuff happens that isn't planned when bodies come together. Uh, and through these kind of experimentations, we learn about things we might like and also about things that we <laughs> definitely don't want to do again. Um, and here we can also think of something like porn as this kind of a, um, as kind of a more conceptual or fantastic testing out of what we might want to do and what we might want to do um, as this kind of a more distance observational approach to what moves our bodies and, and how we might want our bodies to move together with others um, or alone. And, it, and that's, I think for me, an interesting thing in terms of sexuality that uh, desire can really be that which sort of uh, wreaks havoc uh, in terms of one's self-understanding, uh, in terms of what, who uh, we might fancy and how. Uh, so this kind of, there is this thing about sexual desire that both builds identifications and categories of identity and undoes those identifications because the objects of our affection or interest shift and move uh, and, and the kind of routines that we do also shift and move. Because I mean, desires alter during a light person's um, lifetime. Um, I mean, if you like the same things at 50 than you liked at age 14, um, then I think that might be a problem. At least it's a surprise. Um, if it's, it's, if it's a complete kind of fixity of what it is, because bodies learn by living in the world and being with other bodies. And these transformations may be gradual, they might be tiny, or they might be truly, truly drastic uh, in this kind of realm of drama that Berland uh, also comments upon. But basically, they're not identical. Uh, like, we are not identical. This is kind of an obvious thing to say. But I think there is a thing about politics of identity in the realm of sexuality uh, as in a kind of instrument for uh, creating social change that may also fix understandings of, of what bodies actually do and how we are. So it becomes this kind of taxonomy uh, understanding of, of the sexual self uh, in situations we, where we might want to occupy multiple pockets of that taxonomy, or at least move uh, somehow within them. Um, and identity politics can also operate with this kind of basis of origin stories, I was born that way. Um, and of course, we are born certain ways, but then after we, we are born, we, stuff happens. <laughs> I'm not being very intellectual today, am I? Anyway, uh, but I'll return to this point about uh, sexual politics and, and identity towards the, uh, the end. So I think when it comes to sexual, arrangement, sexual arrangements, starting with the notion of consent, um, sex is both bound to rules, um, but it's also resistant to them. 
as this kind of let's see what happens kind of a thing. It's both very routine like and extraordinary at the same time. And there's this um, uncertainty of an open, openness um, of becoming that I think sits uneasily in these preset categories of identity, if we understand these categories as kind of in a literal sense, as a taxonomy, which is sort of how sexual identities have come discussed. If we follow Foucault, that sort of the taxonomy is sort of part of that logic of how, how bodies become, how certain behaviors become understood as um, representative of a type of a person, basically. True sexology. And what happens to uh, sex understood as play is that pushes are pu bodies are pushed into motion in ways that can be pleasurable, they can be painful, strained um, at the same time, or they can also be something else. But basically through this, we learn what we might wanna do, what we might want to do. Um, and as the whole kind of discussion of me too, that broke as I was writing this book, and actually I was almost, no, I was finished with the book when me too actually broke. Uh, in 2017, I was finished with the manuscript. Um, and I was thinking, oh, this is not, this is both a very good time for the book and not at all, because with Me Too, we are again focused on, on social relations of power. We are focusing on sexual violence uh, and kind of, um, kind of uh, ways in which consent uh, is not respected. So we're back to the sexual, poly kind of politics of sexuality. And this is a really important discussion to have. Um, but at the same time, talking about kind of pleasure as an end in itself might seem like a naive uh, argument. Um, I, my, I'm arguing that I'm not naive about it. I'm arguing that that pleasure is actually a complex. It's a very, very complex uh, issue, both in lived practice and both conceptually. Um, and I think scholars often don't take it seriously enough. Uh, uh, it's sort of something that slips through uh, that we don't really focus on quite enough in studies of sexuality even, and that's a bit sad. Um, but obviously play and pleasure, be this sexual or other, are not fully free or voluntary egalitarian or exclusively connected to a positive range of affect, and this is something that Sicard already points out in his discussion on play. So, so let's say people can well not respect each other's uh, boundaries. They can disregard uh, established rules, such as consent. Uh, comfort zones of one pa one's partner might be disregarded in ways that are hurtful and violent. Um, I mean, like any human action, sex can be asymmetrical, hurtful, violent, damaging. Um, but to prioritize sex as a realm of trauma I have an issue with that, uh, the kind of automatic linking with sex and trauma. Uh, trauma can be triggered by anything, a scent, a color, uh, anything. We never know about people's traumas and, and the kind of understanding that, that sort of sex is the stuff of trauma. It might come partly from the very strong influence impact of psychoanalytical theory and studies of sexuality. And actually I sort of think it does. Um, and, and that's never been my framework for thinking about sexuality. I, I sort of don't come from that starting point of, of lack um, as, as a way to sort of think about sexuality. Um, and it's my sort of proposal that foregrounding play allows for new questions to emerge that can run parallel to let's say psychological investigation, but they then they kind of are a different path. Um, so th there are lots of examples of sexual play sort of gone bad, uh, people playing with their own sets of rules, uh, playing other people, playing games with other people. Um, um, but basically, my interest is not so much on power games uh, as it is on kind of play as something that people um, experiment with, test out until they somehow fit, um, or let's say, like with porn, you find examples that might resonate pleasantly with your body in, in the same way with sexual practices, you find things that fit. Um, the thing being, you might not know beforehand what you like until you've done it. It's like what you tell children and, and with food, like you never know, you might like that kale, you better try that kale, but it's actually true in the realm of, of sexuality. And I think it's true in terms of kids and food too, um, as well. 
Um, not everyone plays nice and not everyone plays at all. Hence, this is not like an ontological argument about sex. So what I've, uh, I wonder what this had to do. It probably had something to do with sexual play, but I just put it in here. Um, but basically, conceptually, I started thinking about playfulness as this kind of capacity um, um, or orientation of openness. Uh, to be playful means to be attuned to the world in a certain way. And that means you are ready to experiment. Um, um, and you have a certain degree of curiosity of what might come about. So it's this kind of, oh, let's see kind of a thing. Um, and, and playfulness is also linked to improvisation. It's not synonymous with that, but it sort of has to do with that kind of openness of not knowing what the outcome will be. Um, whereas, whereas play is more strictly about sort of carrying out certain things, doing certain things with this uh, capacity, actualizations of this capacity or orientation. Um, and while they might be more or less clearly defined sets of rules uh, and guidelines, uh, it's not a game. <laughs> so it's not a game with winners and losers. It's not, it's not a game with, with kind of pre-scripted uh, rule. It's, it's more kind of improvisational structure. Although, I mean, with BDSM, uh, it can be also very scripted. Uh, it also can be very literal, but if we think about sex more broadly uh, in terms of play, it's more about this openness of experimentation. Um, so, as I mentioned, my interest is not to think about what sex is, it's more like what play allows us to do in the realm of sexuality. Um, and in, in, when reading into feminist and queer studies of, of sexuality and figuring out how playfulness sort of figures in it, actually Liz Grossi's uh, kind of earlier 1990s work, um, I found kind of inspirational. It's very different from her kind of more recent work um, on the kind of ontological turn, but basically her discussion of sexuality as a matter of identity, um, but also as these kind of uh, experimentations with bodies and, and pleasures um, as a way of organizing bodies and pleasures and orientations. Um, as kind of a active, active evolving process of figuring things out uh, that is driven by desire. But everything is sort of in, in flux. And I, I very much appreciate her way of sort of thinking through, thinking through what we might understand with sexuality, not just as this kind of form of belonging, um, but also uh, a set of practices I don't like the word behavior. It's it's uh, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of a, has a wrong ring for me. Um, but let's say uh, different forms of different ways of doing things, different ways of bodies coming together um, in the realm of pleasure. And and she's one of the authors who really thinks about uh, pleasure. Um, and I like this broad framing of of. Uh, sexuality as impulses, practices, desires that drive people uh, and through which we also come to understand ourselves, hence the notion of identity as one aspect uh, of all this. Um, and when it comes to sort of studies of, of adult sexual play, uh, particularly in the framework of kink, um, one thing that cuts through it, if we forget about the trauma framing, um, is what Andrea Beckman calls the discovery of new intensities uh, that can be broader than genital. They intensities, uh, bodily intensities that go beyond what we previously imagined. So it's a, also a fame of reattuning the body uh, in different way. And sexual play can derive some of its intensity from uh, the incorporation of personal experiences. I mean, hence trauma play, for example. Um, and definitely uh, social relations of power are kind of influential to what, um, they're influential in, in structuring forms of role play, for example, um, and way that sexual scenes come about. 
But I think if analysis sort of stops and, and only focuses on what sexual play might represent or tell about social relations of power, then again, we are forgetting about the complexities of pleasure. So it's kind of both and situation. Because if we understand sex as playful, uh, then it need not serve any value or purpose uh, beyond the quest for bodily intensity and pleasure uh, that has the power to transform those experiencing it. There's this kind of transformative power to pleasure in sex. So I think what happens then if we take this a little further is that the focus on playfulness as this kind of transformative move allows for understanding sexual identity as being con in constant motion as a kind of a contingent thing, if you like. Because individual sexual tastes um, and preferences, let's, I want grace, let's put grace. So taste, preferences, orientations, um, they change during our lifespans. Um, whether it's in terms of, of what kinds of bodies we like, what kinds of acts we like, what kind of body aesthetics we prefer, what kinds of relationship arrangements or lack thereof we might appreciate, how we think about emotional proximity and distance in terms of sex. Uh, is it part of the deal? Is it not part of the deal? Um, all this happens through experimentation uh, and previous life experiences feed that feed our horizon of expectations in terms of what we want and what we don't want. Um, so I'm uh, my so the understanding of sex as this kind of transformative thing. It's not really about the drama of a turn, turning this or turning that. It's often much more subtle motion where things change. Uh, independent if, we, if you're with the same partner for decades, things don't remain the same, uh, independent of the relationship structure. So playfulness as this attitude of openness um, and play as practices of, of experimentation, improvisation can be seen as kind of elementary to or key to the transformations in sexual desires, fantasies, pleasures, orientations. Uh, that happen within, uh, in between, or even despite different categories of identity. Um, and here, Clarissa Smith's discussion on, on masochism uh, has been really useful for me. She talks about masochism as the exploration of the lived body and its transformative potentials that are not necessarily attached to a specific sexual identity. And she's talking about fiction in particular and the pleasures of masochism in fiction. This is the framework uh, which might make it more understandable. So rather than an issue of specific categories such as the masochist, she sees such potential as matter of embodied capacity and effective intensity that can resonate across categories of identity. And I think this emphasis on, on changing sexual tastes and kind of fickle desires um, it sets in motion and also rubs against the logic of categorization that comes about in politics of identity. Uh, in marking certain um, identifications in the realm of sexuality very precisely. And this is the kind of taxonomical imagination that I mentioned earlier. And I understand the purpose it serves. Uh, and in personal life, it can be very empowering. Um, but I think if we think about sexuality uh, kind of over a person's lifespan, then it becomes kind of a difficult thing. We would need a lot of flags uh, um, simultaneously uh, and also in sequence to sort of illustrate what that trajectory uh, for any particular person is. And hence the kind of logic of uh, taxonomy is like a freeze frame of what is now. It doesn't really speak of what has been and where we're going. Uh, it's about the here and now, and hence there are limits to how useful it is for thinking about sexuality. That's what I think. There are pros and there are cons to what we can do with this understanding of, of sexuality. Because uh, as we go about our lives, uh, we experiment with our bodies, the bodies of others. Um, sexual desires continue to carve out new connections and also disconnections. It's the becoming, the unbecoming. It's understanding what we 
want, what we don't want, what may be, the zone of maybe. Um, sensory experiences layer, tastes vary, um, and also our bodily boundaries of comfort become very kind of tenuously redrawn. They don't remain the same either. And sexual desire itself, resists, it resists congealment um, in and through identity categories for the reason that it is not constant, predictable, or knowable as such. It is an unruly thing. Um, and it can really, sexual desire really has the power to throw people way beyond their boundaries of comfort um, as this undoing. Now, my title, Thinking Sex and Play, obviously, uh, builds on Gail Rubin's uh, taxonomy of, of sex, and which is such a classic in studies of sexuality. So in, in 84, Rubin was talking about the kind of understanding of, uh, hierarchical understanding of sexuality um, as this good and bad, <laughs> uh, forms of good and bad. Um, so vanilla and other things, and then this kind of major area of contest, uh, including radical acts such as masturbation, for example, um, um, or lesbians in the bar. But basically, uh, and this has been used as this kind of model for understanding how norms operate uh, as this kind of othering and ousting of tastes. But I think for me, looking at the, especially the, the magic circle of um, of sexuality, so the round shape here. Uh, if we really look at it literally, um, then we can see that the area of the norm is the very center, uh, which almost it's 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 a it's a space that doesn't exist it, where different axes come together, but there is no room for anything. And I think if we sort of work with this model, what we can see it sort of undoes the norm by showing how impossible it is for anyone to occupy the good sex as a norm, as something um, that is, and plus it's a zone where nothing happens. Uh, it's, it's the zone that's completely void of any sort of play. Um, but I think ultimately it sort of, um, it shows the impossibility uh, of the ideal of goodness. And for me, the kind of using the notion of play to think about sex, it's a similar kind of attempt of undoing um, and for me, it's centrally against kind of binary forms of thinking. So play is not opposite to work. Uh, people can be in sex work, people are paid to play the games of others. Um, so the same, same situation can be play and work. Um, work can be enjoyable, play can be painful. Uh, it's not necessarily fun or light. Um, the understanding that kids are not part of the sexual realm, adults don't play, it just doesn't pan out. And I think ultimately as a project um, of thinking of sex in terms of play, it's a project for querying understanding of sexuality because what you have in Rubin's model, the ideal of the kind of heterosexual, how to do it, it's a place of nothingness. So I think what it sort of witnesses is that it's all, we are all on the other side of the wall <laughs> independent of what we do. Um, just because desire is there and with desire stuff moves, um, especially because what it takes here uh, is that if you're non, uh, it's not about reproduction, you're already on the wrong side of the, of the model. Um, so consider in terms of, of play and I'm going to wrap up here. Um, Desire, sexual play basically it's supported by fantasy um, and a playful mood and it's it's geared towards bodily discovery novelty variations of pleasure and I think uh, uh, by default it goes against the kind of normative logic that Rubin is um, Rubin is outlining here um, sexual desire I think undoes <laughs> undoes this model of good sex um, but if we understand porn as simultaneously serious and ludic, so again, playfulness, it's not opposed to being serious uh, at all. It's both bound to rule, it's resistant to rules. Um, sex involves this degree of uncertainty, uncertainty this openness um, of becoming. Um, so 
in experimentation with what and how bodies feel and do and with what or who, um, bodies then become reattuned, I mean, both in terms of their self towards the world, uh, the events that bring different bodies together. And this then creates this motion uh, in individual lives, but also in collective lives, because sexuality is also a political issue, obviously. But I think to, to get back to Belan's question of what studying sex as play rather than as um, a drama, what it does, it helps to highlight improvisation driven by curiosity, uh, playfulness as this kind of desire for variation, um, and openness towards surprise um, as things that greatly matter, both in sexual lives um, and in the scholarly attention towards it. And I think this ultimately really necessitates um, focusing on pleasure and, and taking pleasure seriously um, also as a theoretical issue um, and trying to sort of map it from uh, multiple starting points. So not necessarily confining to psychoanalysis, for example, as a, as a, as a framework for understanding sexuality. But I'm going to stop here and I'm going to finish my co coffee that's grown very cold at this point. Uh, so let's make this bit more interactive. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, so much. Um, yes, we can. We already have uh, several questions that we got in the comment section. But yeah, maybe uh, just before uh, moving to the questions there and I for me not to overtake the floor too much I would just like briefly for you because you already went through it several times but I'm uh, very much interested in in um, what do you see as on the one side as the shortcomings of uh, psychoanalysis as a methodological framework for analyzing sexuality but also sexual politics especially if we consider how much impact it has also made in uh, male mostly queer theory like uh, theories like Lee Edelman, Tim, Dean, Leo Bersani, etc. It's focused mostly on desire and um, the um, capacity to dissolve subjectivity starting from this point, but also its um, obsession with, as you said, trauma, developmental narratives, etc., etc. Uh, and on the other side, what are the cons, which is something that you do incredibly well, and, and I've learned so much from, from your work, on working and setting the focus on affects and affect theory. Although it has also been brought in play in queer theory, especially in reconsidering relations between um, uh, social, different social, sociopolitical realities and the uh, so-called personal affective experience and um, getting out of that interiority still affect has not played i think such great role in thinking about a pleasure in queer theory apart from this uh, analysis that has been done by Cvetkovic, um i don't know uh, heather love berlan etc etc so i think you're doing incredible job here but but i want to hear more about why you find dealing with affect and bodies or bodily surfaces as sources of experimentation, transformation, and um, changes of what a body can do more productive than sticking with psychoanalytic categories that go into interiority, depth, desire, trauma, identity, recognition, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe this uh, uh, methodological position, which I think also some of the students of the school would be interested in, because we already talked in, talked in the first lecture when I also talked about queer theory and psychoanalysis, so which is also my big point of critique, but I would like to hear it to hear it uh, from you. Not an easy question. Thank you. Uh, well, on a personal note, uh, as a student uh, in the 1990s, um, my, I had a professor who was really Lacanian. And I grew up very resistant <laughs> to uh, psych psychoanalytical theory, um, partly because I don't subscribe to the narrative of lack. I don't, starting with Freud, there is the kind of the gender, the whole kind of scene of the fantasy of gender at the heart of that, that's very specific understanding of family life, uh, kind of bourgeoisie Vienna 19th century understanding of, of parenting. And this whole idea that female sexuality, it's basically a space of lack and nothingness. Um, but I mean, I grew up as a film studies student, uh, really participating in, in questions such as does the uh, 
cinematic closure in the end of the film, suture, castration, uh, the wound uh, for the viewer. I mean, this was like a serious discussion still in the 1990s, at least at my university. Um, so I, I grew up resistant, that's the personal narrative. But I think in terms of thinking about sexuality, starting with lack and trauma, um, it really sets a certain tone for what we can figure out. And I just really think that when it comes to the kind of gender dynamics and understanding of desire beyond the phallus, basically, um, I just, for me, it's not productive. I appreciate the work done uh, in psych psychological frameworks and, and I like, and I combine stuff rather freely in my own work, but that's sort of, that's definitely not the starting point partly because it has to do so much with the kind of the individual and as you said, the kind of interiority. With affect as a point of connection, as an event uh, intensity that happens when different bodies meet in the world as the capacity to affect and be affected that then moves bodies from one kind of uh, state to another, drastically or not drastically, uh, basically affect, I mean, in a very kind of Spinozian understanding uh, brings together the kind of constant transformation uh, that we constantly change as we are in the world with other bodies. So there is a kind of form of sociability, but I think it's a, it's a more, more than human sociability because it's not just bodies of people. It's all kinds of environments. And if we think of kink as, an, as a broad example, it's also about object life that's, that becomes animated in a very particular way in our counters, in our counters with it. Um, and that then move, those objects then move human bodies from one state to another. And, and this is no metaphor in very, very concrete ways if we're thinking about that. Um, my interest in affect has been, well, I understand, I just realized we organized a conference affected encounters 20 years ago, two days after 9-11. So I've been trying to tackle it for a long time. Um, at first I had no, <laughs> I had little understanding what was going on. Now I have particular understanding, but it's it's such a broad field that that you're sort of never you're never in it properly. I think at least that's my sense. Um, but my interest has been to think about the starting point was to think about the bodily power of media, uh, not in terms of media effects or anything of that, but really to think about what happens uh, in our counters with media let's say with porn, how bodies on the screen moving, move the bodies of those watching when something happens and how to sort of conceptualize that. And I, I use the notion of resonance to sort of talk about this bodies oscillating at the right frequency without this being a matter of identification necessarily. It can be something much more fleeting and ephemeral. But I think ultimately when working with affect, and this is what I've been thinking about recently a lot is that we, we deal with ambiguity. Um, so although we have this broad divide uh, well with Spinoza and, and then well beyond between the positive as, as that which adds to our life forces and the negative as that which keeps us from thriving or makes us smaller, lessens our ability to move in the world or act in the world, um, things can at the same time be pleasurable and completely destructive. We can heavily desire things that will ruin us uh, things that bring shame can also sexually arouse. I mean, this is no breaking news. So affective complexity that seemingly completely contradictory things happen simultaneously. Um, and hence the kind of understanding that's either positive or negative or somehow easy to classify, it becomes um, undone. And for example, we can also think about, you know, boredom, and excitement as sort of baked into one another, not as polar opposites, but sort of as part of the same thing or distraction and attention, uh, which is what I've been doing recently with the social media project. Um, but I think in addition to focusing on pleasure, um, I'm sort of obsessed with ambiguity um, at the moment. Uh, any person working on culture and society knows that things are complex and ambiguous. Uh, and yet we have this kind of desire for, in a way, simple narratives. Uh, is it good or bad? Should we be concerned? Is it the possibility? Is it a risk? Uh, whether we're talking about new media, whether we're talking about certain sexual practices. Um, and when we focus on ambiguity, 
uh, then we can sort of see what drives bodies uh, in very complex ways and at the same time pulls them in very different directions that can be affirmative and that, that can be destructive um, at the same time. But I think that's a, it's a, it remains a real challenge for, for our critical inquiry to really focus on ambiguity, not, not just as the kind of relativism, you know, it all depends. That's not what I mean. Uh, it's really like when we're analyzing any particular situation in the world, uh, then ambiguity as this kind of framework can have a critical edge rather mm. than representing the opposite, which I think it easily might be mistaken for. Super, uh, well, the, the talk on, on ambiguity um, um, the fit, fits perfectly in, in uh, some of the questions that, that we have. So I would, I would rather not uh, take uh, the time anymore. I would, I would like to go because we have good questions, mm -hmm. which are also related, uh, can, can, can bring us also to, to some of your latest projects. And uh, for example, who's laughing now, uh, <clears throat> but also objectification. So, so yeah, let, let's go with the question. Uh, we have one from uh, Kalia Dimitrova uh, from Skopje, one of the uh, main editors and founders of Medusa Feminist Platform in Skopje. So I would go with, with her question first. Uh, how do you define consent for the purpose of your studies? We always talk about consent as uh, if we all know exactly what it is and how it looks like, but actually it can be really individual and, and uh, complex. And she also has one more uh, related to the drama quote from, from Berlin. Uh, she says in the previous quote, and generally what is meant by drama, drama can also be used for sexual play purposes. Yes, absolutely. Um, Berlant's blog post, it, it dealt with uh, sexual scandals um, and with this kind of titillation of drama and exposure. Um, and and the, it's, it's, it's basically also a critique of sort of, uh, as far as I can remember, of American kind of public discourses around sexuality as this drama of reveal. Um, so she's playing with the drama and play thing uh, in that, and I just took it very literally and ran away with it, basically. So that's what I, that's what I did, but it's true. Uh, yeah, consent. Um, yes, especially post Me Too, it gets thrown around as this kind of like uh, fix all thing, but I think we all have much to learn from kink cultures when it comes to thinking about consent, not as something that is uh, given and fixed, it's more of a process that you negotiate as you go along, because as you go along, you don't know where you'll end up. So consent can't be given beforehand because you don't know where you end up. So it's basically about appreciating the boundaries um, that may suddenly appear without the people knowing previously that they would be there uh, in this moment. It's like, oh no, no, this is not gonna work really. Um, so it's it's more of a kind of a dialogical uh, negotiation and and a, and a processive thing. So it's not just particular to any person. It's very particular about the situation, as the situation changes. So this idea, um, I mean, I understand that rationale. For example, there was discussion in in Sweden for like an app, like before you have sex, you click consent, and then this understanding, like yes, I agree to have sex with this person. Yes, but how <laughs> are you going to have sex with this person? What does that entail? Uh, so consent for the general, like, why not? Let's get frisky, but then you never know where it's going to go. Um, so I think this kind of more processual understanding of what consent is. And the point is, like, as with any kind of human subject research, you can always opt out at any given moment. And that's part of consent. Uh, you can always tap out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, super, I would move now to another question. Uh, Isak Misini, you talk about, he says, you talk about pornography as a tool to discover your likes and dislikes. How do you think pornography influences uh, young people since nowadays it is so easily accessible? Do you think it sets unachievable standards that especially young males strive to achieve? <clears throat> Well, porn is, is many things, and then it also depends uh, what context we are talking about in terms of sex education. Because if we're talking about, um, let's say, the US, uh, where there is no formal sex education in schools, um, 
and even in places like let's say in Finland there's a sex education curricula from the kindergarten uh, that deals with uh, consent and boundaries uh, it starts with that that's the whole kind of rationale it's also been found out that educators the thing that they find most difficult to address is pleasure and hence they often exclude it it's in the curricula but they don't deal with it because it's so tricky so again we get back to this you know reproductive thing uh, maybe herpes but we don't really get to pleasure and what porn promises what it delivers is a different thing but what porn promises is basically bodies acting out pleasure or thriving towards pleasure but of course what porn can show it's only it sort of promises to show how things feel but it can only show how things look and sound and also it's a very particular depending on what genre of porn we are talking because there are many options here but basically it's optimized for the camera for visibility so it's a way of bodies acting out in very particular ways and hence it's not maybe very good educational material for the young person who basically wants to figure out what bodies can do and what can be enjoyable so that's a literal kind of how to do manual um, if it's the only source um, then we have to be sort of specific well it depends also what what porn we are talking about um, Sanna Spisak, who was a PhD student of mine, she's now a postdoc, she did a really interesting study of, uh, of teenagers in Finland and porn. And it's a multi-method study. Um, and what she found out is that the kids really have internalized the sex education curricula saying, you know, real sex is all about intimacy. Porn is not intimate. It's just pretense. And, and the younger teenagers in particular having internalized the script or maybe imagining what the scholar wants to hear they kept on reiterating that kind of narrative and then older teens who, are, who already were having sex with other people than themselves were saying like yeah but it can really be a sort of way to test out fantasies it can really like be this kind of real for figuring out what you might want so it sort of changed in their lives um discursively this is not to say that the kids uh who answered like, oh, it's not really real, it's not really intimate, when using porn for similar purposes as the older teens, but the older teens figured out that kind of intimate arrangements with other people don't foreclose enjoyment taken in porn. It's just a very different thing. Um, and I've been looking at also histories of, of, um, of porn use. We did a memory work oral history project with the Finnish Literary Society, folklore archives, um, seven years ago maybe um, and we asked people to write about their memories of porn and we got lots of responses from um, people writing about 70s and 80s collecting porn magazines as a 12 year old as a 10 year old having this kind of like you know sharing them with friends once VHS tapes came you know figuring out your parents shelf where the porn is hidden rewinding it to the same position and then you know um, so this and, and this would be like kids at 12 collecting porn. So while online porn is, is more readily available, certainly you don't have to sneak into anyone's cupboard to find it or go into the dumpster to find the porn magazines. Um, this is not to say that kids haven't had access to porn before. Um, what we are facing today is this plethora of different pornographies. So in the, in the 80s, let's say in Finland, you would most likely find like a straight mag meant for men. Whereas today, if you look for porn, you might find all kinds of stuff um, that go well beyond what that what those scenarios were. So often when we talk about porn, we talk about very particular understanding of that. Um, but then in empirical studies about what kids think of porn and what they do with it, actually, it's more complex. So I, I'm not sure that that porn is this kind of thing that you know, inter interpolates young people or sort of ruins their fantasy life. I think it's it's a bit more complex than that. And there's a whole discussion about porn literacy in sex education um, that I, I, I think is crucial. Sorry, I'm blabbering. I'm very talkative. Super. Uh, I wanted to, to go with uh, another question, but since you mentioned already education and uh, we have one question also related to this uh, topic uh, related to the Finnish context, which you're familiarized with best probably here so i will go with that one first uh, how we incorporate this topic of playfulness of sex in educational curricula for classes in secondary 
education or secondary class? How is it in Finland? I think it can deliver great lessons of identity to young students, says Alexandra. <clears throat> Good question. I mean, but given the difficulty of talking about pleasure, um, but maybe that would be that would be one thing because very often, like what the curricula is in theory, it's a nationwide curricula, and then what how people teach is those are two different things. Um, but I think in general, kids they would be around what twelve when they when there's like a proper sex ed class for the first time. And if it's when you're 12, you might be interested in what bodies can do and what's out there. You might not be interested in reproduction um, or, or kind of sexual transmitted diseases, uh, which is very often what the sex ed then becomes. And I think it's a challenge for educators to sort of, because one thing is you can't, um, when it comes to sexual cultures, uh, ethically, it's difficult to sort of tell them stuff they don't already know. So how to talk about porn? Uh, with kids, you can't really show them porn. That would be rather unethical. Um, and and sort of how you, how can you sort of work with that boundary of what they know and what they are willing to talk about, and how much you can disclose without adding to their knowledge in ways that would be deemed problematic in terms of the curricula, because there is a real boundary there. But I think playfulness uh, has to do with this: how what bodies might enjoy. So if we would sort of incorporate the take on play as experimentation to talk about different orientations, different ways of doing sexuality, um, then that would be also one way that might actually make sense for the young people. Um, in one of Sanna Spisak's studies, she allowed for the teens, it was a survey. So she didn't, rather than having like, you know, click, click which gender you are or what your orientation is, like define for yourself. And they came up with, um, was it eight or more uh, definitions of their sexuality? Some of them said, uh, oh, it's nice that I could define for the, I'm only 14, I don't really know yet. Like, like it's too early to tell. Uh, I'm like weak and straight <laughs> was one explanation. So they were full of this kind of um, flexibility, unfixity, also like, you know, it's too, too early to tell, I don't really know. Um, and this, Notional play, I think, maps onto this, like as this openness of horizons, like you might be something, you might be something else. Uh, but what was interesting in those that they didn't feel the pressure to pin it down uh, through the norm of straightness. And of course, you can also think that this is like a privileged thing, like if you identify as mainly straight, you can play around a little. Um, but I think it's, it's more than that, uh, because that keeps on repeating in, in studies of young people internationally that people identifying uh, as, as non-straight, as other, and also uh, as gender non-conforming, um, it's, it's, it's an actual thing. The challenge is that sex education, it's very much about binary gender um, and reproduction over pleasure. Uh, so I think there's, there's a danger of doing a disservice to young people who are open to what bodies can, I mean, they are interested they might be nervous in the classroom, but they are definitely interested in what it, what bodies can do. Um, and if they are faced with this, you know, here's a penis, here's a vagina, and here's a baby, or chlamydia, um, then it's not really helpful. God, I'm not really being. Yeah, super, today. super, super. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, probably that's uh, that's where the hardness comes from. Uh, Foucault's statement that pleasure has no passport, and <laughs> I think. <laughs> How, how can it be used tools for Im imagining sexuality beyond the monarchy of sex? Uh, but I'll, I'll go I'll, uh, to, to another question from Artan. Um, are we running the risk here in narrowly defining what play is? It will entail that there are sexualities practiced without playing. Should probably a more radical situation of play as basic human capacity, which can make multiple un undefined movements, open a political struggle to go beyond the current commodified fixed models play of quoting Susanna, what play allows us in the name of sexuality. Would there, for example, practice, would therefore, for example, practices of collective dance be treated as manifestation of sexuality? Maybe, yes. I mean, there is definitely, if we think of classic theorizations of play from Heisinger, 
beyond. It's, it, as it, it is one of the ways in which it's understood is this kind of fundamental human capacity, but also animal capacity. Uh, so it, it's kind of like a, um, an organic uh, capacity, if you like, uh, in all kinds of animal life of which uh, people are part of. And of course, narrowing down sexuality to what bodies do in, in terms of uh, like what is understood as sexual. Uh, I see no point to sort of narrowing it down to let's say the scene of sex um, as such. Then it's more about sexualities um, and about the erotics um, and about how desires become. So it's, I would say like collective dance, for example, can be very sexual, it can be libidinal, it can be very intense, it can be part of, um, of sexual, making of sexual cultures. Um, so definitely, um, I mean, play is this pleasurable experimentation, but it is also about bodies coming together, um, whether it's, it's other human bodies or whether it's um, inorganic objects or whatever it is. Um, but, but true play, um, it's kind of like this um, kind of effective reattunement. Bodies are moved from one state to another and hence they tra transform. Um, but then th with any definition, there's a risk of making it either too narrow or too expansive so that suddenly everything is something. And then conceptually, it's not very helpful either. So my, my focus has been very much to understand sex. <laughs> Uh, in the and, and sort of figuring it out slightly differently from how studies of uh, let's say how the traditional sexology for example has trended has tended to frame it so my my focus has been very much on the kind of scene of sex but I'm not saying that that's the only productive way of, of thinking about it mm, sure yeah and um, <clears throat> we can go with maybe with one question before we close if you <clears throat> if you're enthusiastic I am burning to hear uh, something more on 50 shades of gray but yeah I'll <laughs> have to <laughs> respect first the questions from the people following us in this past hour and more so um uh, kind of a question that follows up on my uh, previous comment uh, question um if we don't search for the answer in our past trauma and other concepts connected to psychoanalysis then how do we explain the fixation on certain sexual practices behaviors in parentheses, uh, even if we see them as play. Uh, I feel like uh, the psychoanalysis perspective on this, is treated as a, of, on this is treated as a general truth. Maybe some books, texts, suggestions that follow up on this lecture and discussion, especially on the points related to effect. <clears throat> I think the thing is that sexuality is never it's never experienced the same way um, by, by people. So sexual histories are, are different. Histories of trauma are very different. Histories of trauma, I mean, we all live with trauma, but in different shapes and forms of intensities. And, and with some of us, uh, the trauma has little to do with sex. Uh, it can be something completely different. And then with some people, sexuality really becomes the train of trauma. Um, but to generalize this kind of conflation of sex with trauma, I think that's a politically problematic thing, and um, which also also feeds into, let's say, ethical ethics reviews of how difficult it can be to get ethics clearance for a study of sexuality just because sex is understood as this kind of uh, realm of vulnerability and trauma by default. Now it can be, but labor, work can be extreme zone, academic labor for sure can be an intense zone of vulnerability and hurt and trauma. So if you're doing a study of let's say precarious uh, PhD students, uh, you are bound to tap into all kinds of uh, trauma stuff there, uh, well beyond sexuality. So I think it's a kind of a broader politics of how, what we prioritize as the, as the stuff of trauma um, and what we understand with trauma. Um, is it always the thing that really eats away at our capacities or is it something that has shaped us into beings? Is it like a problem to solve or is it something that just explains how we are made? Uh, and it can be both. <laughs>
uh, and it can be something else as, as well. Now, there really isn't a huge amount on affect and sexuality. Um, I mean, increasingly, I think that's happening. But when I was working on this book, uh, and I was in particular interested in, um, because, well, if kind of new, more new materialists take um, on throwing, drawing on, on Gilles Deleuze and, and Félix Cattery, uh, isn't really interested in, um, it's interested in bodies, but it's a different, it's more about the kind of pre-social, pre-cognitive intensities. Um, but there are some studies that apply, and I can dig up references to Slavshot because my memory of names is really, is really, uh, it's really awful. Um, but the general interest tends to be, um, it tends not to revolve around kind of sexual bodies in, in such intensity. Was, in particular, I was looking for literature that would build on, on Sylvan Tompkins because I've been so mesmerized by his take on excitement as that which makes the self. Uh, and I was able to find one unpublished uh, PhD that then Samantha did send me and, and it was really useful. But it's, it's the same with, with the whole project on, on play that I really wasn't able to find a huge amount of literature. Um, and when it comes to affect and sex, it's not a huge field. It's not a huge field. So there's much to be, I think there's really much to be done that's productive. Mm -hmm. Super, uh, Susan. I, I, I wouldn't go with any further questions. Once again, if you have something to add related to Fifty Shades of, of, of Grey <laughs> and that trauma of a fe feather touching a body, especially in the movie, I cannot forget that scene. <laughs> I was like, well, the, the movies are the problem with the movies is that they can't. The books basically are about monomanic monogamous romantic desire that's overpowering overwhelming and fixated on one object uh, it's a desire that is possessive there's a whole fetishization of the wedding ring like a, like literally a fetish like really like they fondle it or like i can feel a callus under the ring kind of thing so it's it's basically it's a well it's a fan fiction of um Oh God, what's the vampire fiction now? Um, Twilight. So it's a it's a originally a fanfic of Twilight. So the vampire becomes a billionaire, um, and the young maid is still the young maid. Uh, and then there are dark games that they play, but it's it's meshed in with kind of a kind of a gothic romance, and following very much the narrative patterns identified in the eighties uh, in in sort of romantic genre fiction. But it's basically, I think, the appeal of, because there's a real appeal to the first book in particular, less to the films, um, because it was this phenomenon. I think it, it really is about, it's a story of desire. And, and for the female protagonist, who's never even masturbated, she's like tabula rasa, completely, she discovers what her body can do, because she has this master to teach her body what, you know, what it might do. So it's, it's finding pleasure, and it's also... It is a fantasy about particular intermeshing of, of romantic desire with sexual desire in a very normative, in a very conservative kind of a framework. Most public discourse, of course, has been about the kind of misrepresentation of kink. Fair enough, it's not a very good representation of, of kink, um, but it's written from the outside. It's not written by a practitioner. It's this fantasy of what that might be. Um, and hence, it's interesting that it really fueled this commodity market of Fifty Shades of Grey, handcuffs and feather, feathers and, and all kinds of stuff, uh, at least for a while. Um, th and those were sold in like department stores, at least in Finland. Um, so it was also a way in which the kind of register of sexual uh, playthings broadened beyond the sex shop. Um, of course, I mean, sex toys for women have been on sale in pharmacies at least in, in in the nordic countries for a while not for men because there's this understanding that poor women uh we need help <laughs> with our sexuality because it's the lack there's nothing there so we have to learn and we need the instruments to do it so it's always more respectable 
for women to explore themselves because apparently we don't know what's there so we have to find it uh, with all available tools and, and toys. Um, so it boils down to a very particular understanding of female sexuality in terms of, of lack. And of course, there are sexual norms and social norms that provide different bodies with different space to be in the world and experience the world. But as a, as a categorical gender divide, no, no. Like any kind of binary divide, it just doesn't really work. So my interest in, in Fifty Shades, and there's a whole chapter on Fifty Shades um, in my book, and actually, if I may advertise, there's also an open access article or chapter um, in a, it's a Manchester University Press on, on vulnerabilities. Um, and I'm, and I'm sort of, it's, it's, it's a variation of the analysis. It's treating uh, Mr. Gray, the protagonist, uh, straight male, straight wild, white male, vulnerability as, as a figure of kind of a fantasy figure, a gendered fantasy figure. Mm. My interest was in really taking seriously, like what is the appeal of this fiction? Because it's not obvious, um, but I think it, it really is about, it's the desire, the story about desire that's told through many generic forms that then gives it kind of a compelling quality. I mean, it really builds on so many things that have been tried and tested and then adds kink to it that then gives this kind of modern spin to the whole thing, but it's not, it's not very modern, the whole thing. Yeah. And of course, the, the thing with the film is they can't, they can't show anything. So the highlight of the books is all the sex scenes and, and all that is cut in the uh -huh. film. And the first film in particular, there's much more, you know, throughout the films, there's much more uh, kind of sensuous attention paid on object life the helicopter, the interior design. There's like true sensuousness to how the object like life is. Um, but the protagonists, they just, the casting is awful. They don't really, they know there's nothing there. So in a way the, the body's performing uh, sexual ecstasy are much less animated in a way than the object life. So there's the film scholar in me sort of, I could do a whole reading of that, but I'm, I'm not going to. Super. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Susanna, once again for uh, for joining us uh, tonight. I think we we had a great experience and, and, and I hope that people following us uh, got inspired maybe to do by themselves some research scholarly, but maybe otherwise borderly. Uh, and yeah, it is always a pleasure talking to you. I hope to to see you next summer in Belgrade and this pandemic ends till then. I Certainly hope so. Uh, no, it's a shame I couldn't come over, but another time. And thank you for having me. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you once again. It's been a pleasure having you. So, so everybody, have a have a good night. Bye. You too. Bye.